Indiana News Desk is made possible in part by Smithville, Fiber Internet, Streaming TV, Home Security and Automation in Southern Indiana. More information at smithville.com. Mallor Grodner Attorneys, providing legal services to clients and the community. Understanding, expertise, results. Bloomington and Indianapolis. LawMG.com. IU Alumni Association, connecting IU's network of alumni and sharing the Indiana spirit through scholarships, advocacy, and volunteerism. Alumni.iu.edu. IU Center for Rural Engagement, extending IU Bloomington resources to improve Hoosier lives in partnership with communities and organizations. Rural.indiana.edu and by WTIU members. Thank you. Coming up on Indiana News Desk. Tens of thousands of Hoosier healthcare workers are getting their first dose of the COVID-19 vaccine this week, but exactly how much more vaccine the state can dole out in the coming weeks and to whom is still unclear. As more vaccine becomes available, we will continue to roll out eligibility to additional populations. And the vice president is praising the efforts of a Bloomington company to produce thousands of vials of the vaccine. We have come to the beginning of the end of the coronavirus pandemic. Uh, we can see the end from here, uh, but uh, it's been a marathon this year. Get ready. As I-69 construction continues, prepare for major detours through Martinsville that will affect your commute between southern Indiana and Indianapolis. Those stories, plus the latest news headlines from across the state, we're pretty well maxed out right now on Indiana News Desk. Welcome to Indiana News Desk. I'm Joe Wren. Well, we're a little more than halfway through December and the state has already recorded about 1,200 deaths this month. That pushes Indiana's pandemic death toll past 7,000. The number of COVID cases in the state is up to about 450,000. Meanwhile, Indiana's health commissioner is urging Hoosiers to stay the course going into the holidays, practice social distancing, wear masks, stay home when you're sick. She says the safest way to celebrate the season is to limit gatherings to your immediate family or celebrate virtually. I know many Hoosiers just want this pandemic to be over and are eager to receive their vaccine. Please know that we will get it to you as soon as we possibly can. Indiana's frontline health care workers begin receiving the state's first shots of the COVID vaccine this week. The state got about 55,000 doses and there are about 400,000 health care workers who are eligible. I got invited to be a little part of history. It's spectacular. Uh, no, no other way to describe it. Um, I, you know, we feel privileged and blessed and this is truly the light at the end of what has been a very long tunnel. Rumpf was the first person to get the vaccine at IU Health Methodist, one of five hospitals in Indiana that received the initial round of doses this week. Indiana health officials say they expect to have vaccines available at an additional 50 hospitals in a matter of days, including IU Health Bloomington. But they also say the number of new doses coming next week will be less than anticipated. And that's causing the state to revise its original vaccination plan, which called for vulnerable populations to be next in line for the vaccination. But with limited supplies, the state will now prioritize essential workers ahead of the vulnerable. Catalan's Bloomington facility is a major player in coronavirus vaccine development and distribution. As Adam Pinsker reports, the effort is drawing praise from Vice President Mike Pence. Landing in his home state for just a few hours on Tuesday, Vice President Mike Pence heard from executives with the drug maker Moderna and Catalan, whose sprawling facility just west of downtown Bloomington is producing thousands of vials of the COVID vaccine. We have come to the beginning of the end of the coronavirus pandemic. Uh, we can see the end from here. Moderna is one of the government's private sector partners in Operation Warp Speed. The program launched in May to expedite the production of a coronavirus vaccine. The development and the manufacture of a vaccine, the experts here will no doubt confirm, usually takes between 8 and 12 years. We are on track uh, not only to develop, manufacture, but distribute a vaccine uh, between 8 and 12 months. Uh, it is a medical miracle. A miracle that the vice president and others compared to how quickly the U.S. mobilized for its entry into World War II almost 80 years ago. Moderna's vaccine is expected to get expedited approval from the FDA. After it does, 
Catalan CEO says 20 million doses will go out before the end of the year. More than 2,000 Catalan employees have been working around the clock on the effort. Volunteering for production shift over Thanksgiving, over Christmas even, because everybody understands the mission. Once essential health care workers and the elderly get the vaccine, Trump administration officials say it should be widely available to the general population by February. The greatest threat that we have right now, it's not technology, it's not the, I'll say, miraculous reality that a vaccine, two vaccines were developed in less than a year. It's really being aggressive in our unity to confront vaccine hesitancy. Pence says the vaccine's 95% effective rating is better than that of the measles and flu vaccine. Uh, we have cut red tape, but we've cut no corners when it comes to the development of this vaccine. Uh, I, I look forward in the days ahead uh, to, uh, to receiving the vaccine myself. For Indiana News Desk, I'm Adam Pinsker. As the coronavirus tightens its grip on Indiana and the country, end of year holidays are causing concern. The exponential rise in cases will continue. With vaccine availability for the general public likely still months away, more lives will be lost. But is a full shutdown the answer? Brock Turner has more on the toughest uh, choices facing policymakers. Like many Hoosiers, Tanya Mintgen is ready to put 2020 behind her. She owns three fat labs, an event venue, and bed and breakfast in Putnam County. 2020 has challenged her business in every way. I ended up canceling March, April, May, and most of June. I got my last June wedding off here. So, you know, that's pretty much four months of revenue. It's um, the staff didn't make any money. So, you know, they were all hoping on unemployment, which if they worked for me full time during peak season, they didn't get an unemployment because they were a subcontractor. Appearing in the Netflix series Say I Do led to a significant increase in bookings for 2021. But Minkin worries if virus cases are still high next year, people will continue to cancel plans, weddings, and events. With the ones that were postponed and moved and the few that decided to cancel, I probably took a $175,000 hit. The governor's latest order restricts crowd sizes to 25 in the highest risk counties which is nearly half the state. Larger events can still receive special permits from local health departments, but that process can be time intensive. Experts say a robust contact tracing program would allow for the greatest economic freedom while limiting the virus's spread. And even if some businesses are closed, targeted aid could assist them. Let's find a way to keep them economically viable and, and afloat until we kind of we have a virus a vaccine. Um, but, but we kind of have our hands tied because we don't really know what that is. That aid hasn't come from the federal government yet. Congress is still debating a second economic stimulus, which has handcuffed local and state officials. Many experts agree the lack of federal support, paired with poor contact tracing, has led to the difficult choice Holcomb and local officials face. I think one of our biggest concerns was that we didn't have a public health um, push in the governor's ear that was as um, impactful as the business community. And so it became a choice that doesn't really exist because you, you can't really have a strong economy without during a pandemic if people don't trust, people won't go spend money. So, um, you know, we've all gotten into this battle about whether the economy should open or we should take care of the virus, but it's really, it all has to work together. Eileen White experienced this firsthand. She's worked as an epidemiologist in several states and was eager to help her local health department in Fishers but resigned after just a few weeks on the job, alleging political bias impacted science and data. There's always some political component to um, any governmental job. I mean, we can't deny that that, that lives in everything. Um, but what I had never experienced before, which is new for most people in public health, is this um, twisting of data to fit a narrative that the data does not support. That's something Fisher's Mayor Scott Fadness denied, but he does agree that local governments can be put in a precarious spot. They're granted the authority to take away people's abilities to do things and to restrict them in terms of commerce. But as a government, we are not provided the resources to alleviate some of those restrictions. So in a perfect world, you would have both capabilities so that you could architect a solution that says, Hey, we have to change these behaviors for a period of time, and we know that that has an economic consequence. 
and we can tailor a solution in our local economy to try to ease the burden on those most impacted. I see that this is a struggle, right? Public, we're none, nobody in public health is saying that the economy isn't important. But what we're saying is that lots and lots of people getting sick will impact the economy. Um, and hospitals are at capacity now. So we are not in a better place. And I think we've seen that the choices that were made did not work. And when you talk about like the stay at home order or shutting down the economy, that's an extreme, right? That's we're going to shut everything down or even just opening everything up is another extreme. Kind of the optimal should be something where we identify the things that are spreading the virus the most and are also the easiest for us to reduce. It's too late for many businesses. It's been nearly 10 months since the pandemic started and many haven't been able to hang on. Menken, though, considers herself lucky. A federal paycheck protection program loan helped pay the venue's mortgage while it was closed. Others, though, weren't as fortunate. She's seen many businesses she used to work with close. I normally bring in about $70,000 a year on lodging. I brought in 26000 this year. That was, yeah. So, I mean, it's, it's been felt by me. It's been felt by all the mom and pops in town. It's, it's the mom and pop type businesses that are really feeling the effect of it. All Minkin can hope for is this virus and the restrictions it's been married to in 2020 will be mitigated when weddings begin this spring. For Indiana News Desk, I'm Brock Turner. Well, and conducting church services during COVID-19 has been a hot button issue. Lexi Vanetti reports on how St. Paul's Catholic Center in Bloomington is handling the pandemic. COVID-19 affects the holiday season, but religious services are still open. The state has issued recommendation about distancing, masking, and meeting remotely when possible, but has said from the beginning of the pandemic that places of worship can still operate as they see fit. State officials have acknowledged the virus can be spread through religious gatherings. State Health Commissioner Dr. Chris Box noted that recently. I would say that of the top four or five contact tracing events that we have, there is a spike every week on Sunday related to church events. Some faith communities are making adjustments on their own. Father Patrick of St. Paul Catholic Center in Bloomington says the center has limited capacity of services. Before COVID, uh, we were probably, during the school year, we would see probably anywhere from 12 to 1600 people a weekend. With COVID, we're probably seeing about a third of that. St. Paul Center added Christmas services in anticipation of more people wanting to attend Christmas Masses. We're adding Christmas services because sometimes people only go to Christmas and we want to make sure that if people uh, want to come, they have that opportunity. So we've added a service on Christmas Eve to make that possible. He says church leaders are aware not everyone feels safe attending in person and take that into account. The Archdiocese has um, lifted the obligation for attendance at Mass on Sundays and Holy Days uh, since mid-March when we closed down. Most places of worship have the option of online service and have adjusted protocol. For Indiana News Desk, I'm Lexi Venetti. Coming up next on Indiana News Desk. Construction on I-69 will force traffic to reroute around Martinsville for most of 2021. Ahead, how that will affect one local business and what's ahead for the city. And if you're looking to get into the holiday spirit, you won't want to miss it, as a father and son duo give us a tour of their massive holiday display. These stories and more right here on Indiana News Desk. Stay close to Indiana News Desk as we trace education issues all the way from the Capitol to your child's classroom. So many topics that arise each year in the State House affect what happens every day in the schoolhouse. The WTIU News Team is committed to helping you stay up to date with the issues that affect your family's future. Keep yourself informed. Tune in to Indiana News Desk, your source for regional and state in-depth news. Welcome to the Amanpour on PBS. I'm Christiane Amanpour in London, giving you the global view. I've covered the world for nearly three decades, and I'm dedicated to bringing you all the facts. Please join me for conversations with newsmakers, world leaders. Good to be with you, Christiane. Artists and writers, the people who define, change, and challenge our world. That's Amanpour on PBS. Welcome back to Indiana News Desk. 
After decades of planning and construction, the state is trying to fast track construction of the remaining sections of Interstate 69. Along that comes traffic delays and detours. Beginning January 2nd, NDOT plans to reroute traffic through Martinsville. It will make the commute between Indianapolis and southern Indiana longer than usual. But as Adam Pinsker reports, officials say the detour is only temporary and the plan will help shave months off the construction time. Like most small businesses around Indiana, Indy's restaurant in Martinsville is struggling to keep its doors open during the pandemic. It shut down for a few weeks at the start of the pandemic, but when it opened back up, not all the regular crowds returned. Since we've opened back up, I mean, we've gotten busier and busier, but at first it was really slow. People were scared to come out. You know, we've had to do shorter hours because we lost so many employees from being laid off. Now the restaurant is facing another roadblock, I-69 construction. NDOT took a large sign and about 25 parking spaces away from Indies to make room for a future off-ramp. They said, what, 45 years ago when it got put up, they didn't get a right permit for it? So we didn't get reimbursed for that at all. NDOT officials say that sign was located on state right-of-way. Pruitt placed a temporary sign outside to alert customers to an area behind the restaurant where they can park, but not everyone sees it. Always parking issues. We have to have people move their cars because people are blocked in or, or, you know, they can't get in so they park at Taco Bell or they, they say we would have came yesterday but there was nowhere to park. State Road 37 will remain closed from the 39 interchange to Morgan Street until at least the end of 2021. It's a big time saver for the project. It's actually um, saving an entire construction season um, to complete this mainline work right there in Martinsville. Drivers can take 39 to State Road 67 and either detour back to State Road 37 on Highway 144 or continue on 67 toward Mooresville and Indianapolis. To accommodate for the extra traffic, NDOT expanded State Road 39 to four lanes, but only up to the railroad tracks. Beyond that, the road will remain one lane in each direction. Because that's in the floodplain, um, it would have been a much more extensive um, amount of construction um, that would have involved um, physically lifting the roadway. Um, the railroad would have been involved to adjust their grade. Martinsville Mayor Kenny Costin is well aware the detour will bring extra traffic into his town. It's going to be a nightmare. I mean, there's no easy way to put it, but we just all need to remain calm, realize that we're all going to be frustrated, have a little patience. But I-69 isn't the only construction project going on in Martinsville. The Ohio Street and South Street projects will involve some resurfacing and the addition of sidewalks. Crews are also fast-tracking a water main replacement project in downtown before the detours take effect. Infrastructure is so old that if we don't replace it, the vibrations we're liable to have breaks and it will be a nightmare trying to fix something in the middle of the street once we have all this traffic coming through the downtown. The I-69 project has been in the works for decades. Officials anticipate the final portion of the interstate connecting Martinsville to I-465 in Indianapolis will be complete by 2024. It's very significant, um, especially to those um, in the southwest corner of the state. We'll give them a more direct path to Indianapolis and then points beyond. Mayor Costin thinks Martinsville will ultimately benefit from the interstate. He hopes the construction on the section through his town doesn't hit any roadblocks and is completed in time for the city's bicentennial in 2022. I think Martinsville is going to be positioned to boom. Uh, I think that uh, we've got a lot of great things that are going to happen. We've got some things that are happening on our downtown area, so I think it's all going to come together. But for Pruitt, the roadmap to a new interstate through her town comes with a price she doesn't want to pay. It's really sad, really, to see like all the trees down when you go down the highway now, and like everything just mold over, you know, all the houses that they've taken out. Yeah, it's really different. In 2021, NDOT says you'd expect to see parts of 37 north of Martinsville down to one lane as crews work on the opposite side of the road. For Indiana News Desk, I'm Adam Pinsker. Now for headlines, we go over to Ethan Burks in the newsroom, who has the latest on this week's top stories. Hi, Ethan. Thanks, Joe. For the first time in history, the U.S. government has carried out more executions in a year than all states that still conduct executions according to an annual report on the death penalty. There have been 10 federal executions carried out this year by the Trump administration. That's a higher yearly total than under any presidency since the 1800s. The federal government has three more executions scheduled for January before Trump leaves office, including Lisa Montgomery, who would become the first woman executed by the federal government in almost 70 years. 
States carried out just seven executions in 2020 after per putting 22 people to death in 2019. Some members of Bloomington City Council say the city needs to place a moratorium on clearing out homeless encampments as long as the pandemic continues to be a major health concern. The Bloomington Police Department sent downtown resource officers into Seminary Park last week to remove tents so that people experiencing homelessness did not violate park rules and sleep there overnight. City Council says they weren't notified about that plan in advance, and Councilor Isabel Piedmont-Smith says it goes against CDC COVID-19 guidelines to displace homeless people in encampments during the pandemic. She says at a bare minimum, the city should provide accessible restrooms and hand-washing stations in all parks. We need to figure out a way to make it work because um, it's a matter both of human dignity, having a place to use the toilet, and of public health. Bloomington Mayor John Hamilton maintains there are beds available in the community for people to sleep, and setting up camp in parks is not safe. The Indiana Supreme Court ruled Tuesday that the Indiana legislator overstepped its legal bounds in 2017 when it, be, when it barred the city of Bloomington from annexing any part of Monroe County to 2022. The Indiana General Assembly passed legislation in early 2017 that prohibited annexation action proposed in the first six months of 2017. But that came after Bloomington Mayor John Hamilton had announced in February the city planned to annex nearly 10,000 acres of Monroe County. The state Supreme Court ruled the legislation was unconstitutional because it targeted only Bloomington. We're going to be figuring out what the next steps are. I've, I've just barely read the opinion and we've got lawyers who need to weigh in and look exactly what the options are going forward. Hamilton said he began the annexation in 2017 because at the time it had been 12 years since Bloomington expanded its boundaries. And the Indiana football team had its final two games of the regular season canceled due to a rising number of positive COVID-19 cases. But as Pat Bean reports, the Hoosier season is not over. This season has been a strange one for Indiana football, but that was to be expected in the middle of a pandemic. After initially canceling the entire season due to COVID-19, the Big Ten settled on a nine-game, conference-only schedule that began almost two months late. Opportunity number one. 2020 season begins. Indiana made it through its first seven games, going six and one and earning the number seven ranking in the country, its highest in more than 50 years. But last week, the virus infiltrated the program. Indiana recorded 28 positive COVID-19 cases and was forced to cancel its annual game against Purdue for a second straight week. It's kind of par for the course for, for 2020. You know, it's been a, a series of things that have happened that, that nobody really wanted to happen and things get canceled. and that you look forward to and and then when it, but it, it was the, the fact that it was canceled and then rescheduled and then canceled again it's just kind of like double whammy and while the rivals will not play for the first time since 1919 it's not the end of the season for the hoosiers indiana is expected to receive a bid to a new year's six bowl one of the six bowl games that make up the bowl championship series and that's something that hasn't happened since 1967 when indiana played southern cal in the rose bowl Massive opportunity for us uh, at our at our fingertips, and but any, any bowl opportunity for us is going to be huge, and we haven't won a bowl game here in a long, long time. For Indiana News Desk, I'm Pat Bean. Several bowl projections have Indiana playing Southern California in the Fiesta Bowl on January 2nd. The bowl pairings will be announced this Sunday. And, Joe, wherever Indiana ends up playing in a bowl, regardless, it's been a remarkable season for the Hoosiers. It sure has. Ethan, thank you very much. Thanks, Joe. Well, Christmas light display is growing so large and Ellettsville family says it's using almost all their power. But even still, the family says they're getting more out of the project than they put into it. We're pretty well maxed out. We have some more things in the garage, obviously. So if something goes out, we can replace it with something. So 35 yard pieces, 45 blow ups, six blow molds, 18 trees, 20 snowflakes and stars, 125 smaller yard pieces, 20 toy soldiers, 10 wreaths, uh, let's see, over 500,000 actual lights. It's about 170 to 180 amps. Okay, my electrical box has 200 amps in it. So I'm planning on upgrading my service probably next year. Closeout sales is really where we've gotten almost everything. You're probably looking at, you know, retail over $30,000 worth of decorations out here. Lay out a diagram of the yard, use a Google Maps picture. Um, at first, I was just Santa's helper, and I was real young and little. But as I've gotten older, and he's taught me, and I know more about the stuff, I've started to put things up myself. We don't just flip a switch on, and it's up. 
you know. There's at it's least, right an, the I, I already have an hour and a half into the yard today. He's up there sometimes, once or twice every few oh. days, <laughs> turning bulbs a certain way. I do. Hey, thank you. Thank you. Merry, Merry Christmas. Christmas. We've had people far as, I've been, I can even tell you, 100 miles away. We moved here in 2003. So it was like, it was small. It started small. And people really enjoyed it. And obviously, the bigger it got, the more they enjoyed it. It's brought about so many memories that they enjoy seeing it. They enjoy bringing their kids out. Um, and that's that's why I keep doing it. Um, I mean, we can't I, stop I being now. being part of something big that brings joy to a lot of people. Yeah, it's bigger than us, right? Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it's being part of something bigger than yourself. The house is at 503 Ritter Street in Ellettsville. The display is on from 5 p.m. to 11 p.m. until New Year's Day. Well, that's the end of this program, but our work continues online as we cover the news throughout the week at WTIUNews.org. We won't have a show next week because of Christmas, but we'll be back on January 1st. Have a great weekend and enjoy the holidays. Indiana News Desk is made possible in part by Smithville, Fiber Internet, Streaming TV, Home Security and Automation in Southern Indiana. More information at smithville.com. Mallor Grodner Attorneys, providing legal services to clients and the community. Understanding, expertise, results. Bloomington and Indianapolis. LawMG.com. IU Alumni Association, connecting IU's network of alumni and sharing the Indiana spirit through scholarships, advocacy, and volunteerism. Alumni.iu.edu. IU Center for Rural Engagement, extending IU Bloomington resources to improve Hoosier lives in partnership with communities and organizations. Rural.indiana.edu. And by WTIU members. Thank you.